April is Earth Month. I don't know, just a little history really quick. Earth Day was kind of the beginning of the creation of Earth Month. Now it's probably for us to say that Earth Day didn't start till April of 1970. <laughs> it's, that's when it officially was uh, uh, given legislative credence. So it's been going on. This will be a 53rd year. Um, some people would say they've celebrated Earth Day for a lot longer than that, which is good, especially a lot of our indigenous peoples. Um, and since we're talking about the Earth, we thought I'd start us with a story. And this story, um, our niece, when she was probably in kindergarten, first grade, heard it. She still couldn't read, but she memorized it because she really loved it and gave it as a uh, um, her at her class near share share time. This is the what she wanted to share. She's a very dramatic, very engaged uh, young girl. It's called Skunks. <laughs> the stunkiest stink ever to stink. The stinkiest stink to skunk. Far worse than a moldy garbage can when you reach down and scoop out the gunk. A million times worse than octopus armpits or sniffling an elephant trunk. Is the galling, gall galling, appalling, truly enthralling, glorious stink of a skunk. <laughs> Sing songs to the stink of a skunk. Ring gongs to the stink of a skunk. Ding dongs to the stink of a skunk. The glorious stink of a skunk. But the stink of a skunk, I always have funk, is more than a sweet bouquet. There are numerous other things, like a punk, can do with heavenly spray. A spray that can stun and even squirrels, almost radioactive, which for normal boys and girls makes it quite attractive. <laughs> First of all, it's valid to keep a skunk as a pet and spray your family's salad in place of a vinaigrette. <laughs> it's okay to spray on the toothbrushes of everyone in your family. It's okay to spray in the dresser drawer where your sister keeps her pajama. <laughs> Skunks make excellent hats, really cozy undies, whip their spray like cool with and slather ice cream sundaes. <laughs> a giant mound of skunks makes an incredibly comfortable bed and plays with fluffy slippers a pair of skunks instead. <laughs> skunks make superior sprinklers for watering your grass, pump their tails several times, and spray insects with their gas. <laughs> Skunks for, super scopus, skunks for super soakers, it's okay to play inside. A hovercraft of squirting skunks, take it for a ride. Get married to a skunk and save a thousand bucks. You can carbonate all the wedding drinks and won't require a tux. Punk <laughs> robber skunks, bizarrely tattooed, ninja skunks with attitude. Sumo skunks, scarfing food, skunks with purple, Mohawk. Dude. <laughs> They're perfect for powdering noses with their very own built-in hair. They're perfect for washing windows with their very own built-in sprayer. Why can't Santa slip pulled by skunks instead? Reindeer are level fellas, but skunks have jet propellers. <laughs> Choose skunk gas at the gas station to fill your limousine. It's high octane and unleaded and will make your car run clean. <laughs> Place a skunk in brother's bunk, drop one in his back, her plunk. <laughs> Climb into your skunk mobile, snap a skunk salute, then rock it out of the skunk cave in your super skunker suit. Hyper windshield wiper skunks, little baby diaper skunks, not only are they likable, they're naturally recyclable. <laughs> skunk cabbage casserole, spicy skunk salami, skunk tornadoes, skunk volcanoes, a giant skunk tsunami. Your neighbors will soon catch a wind of the fact that there are skunks in your apartment and frantically will contact the stink control department. Anti-skunk commandos will parachute from jets with tranquilizer weapons to neutralize your pets. Ninja skunks will counterattack, sumo skunks will charge, blimp skunks overhead will drop their skunk discharge. Skunkzilla and Skunk Kong will lift their monstrous tails, aim at the attackers, and spray like spouts of whales. The attackers have been skunked, and you may rest content. 
with your loving stone companions who are truly heaven sent. <laughs> <laughs> Cute little story to get us started. Um, we're going to be talking about Echo Challenge. Um, and Echo Challenge was originally started about 29 years ago as the Northwest Earth Institute. Um, and they've kind of rebranded their name. They're out of, out of Portland. Uh, we have a friend who introduced us to them probably 20 years ago when we took their um, simple, simple, simple. Simple, uh, living simply uh, class. And at that time, they had um, this we took out of a library at uh, Key Peninsulas at Key Center's library. So they spread out, they have to have different things organized. Um, and this is kind of their, their motto from the beginning was motivating individuals to examine and transform personal values and habits, to accept responsibility for the earth, and to act on that commitment. So they have different uh, events that happen during the year. And in this case, this is Earth Month, so they're having their Earth Month challenge. And what they do, and this is a, a, a regular, they've used the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals to, to build this month's process. And we can see them, so no poverty, zero hunger, uh, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable um, and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, required inequalities, reduced inequalities, sustainable goals and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions and partnerships for the goals. And they, they use these SDGs as uh, sustainable development goals um, to create some possibilities uh, for, for you to participate um, and you, you choose and I'm going to go through and cycle through some just so you can see how it goes. Um, actions that you can take, and they can be daily actions. For instance, one that I've done is uh, you determine how long, but it says to meditate each day on, on nature for a certain amount of time. So I've been using a, a couple of books. Uh, one is Becoming Rooted. It's a Native American. Randy Woodley is actually a professor of uh, theology um, down at uh, Pacific Theology, which is run through George Fox University. Um, so I use him, native writer, uh, what constantly dwells or deals with relationship to, to earth. So you can use whatever you want to, or another one that I started using as well is Undrowned uh, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. And she calls herself a, a marine nerd, um, and she studies the marine mammals and then relates them to uh, Black feminist thought or experience. Um, so just something to use to, to guide your way towards thinking about um, the earth and nature. And these goals are broad enough because there's lots of ways to fill in. So like you're talking about inequalities and the like, as well as talking about specific um, picking up garbage. Um, this friend that I told you about, um, she didn't know they had rebranded, so I told her about it. So our we have a we have a team that we've created. So you can you have to sign into a team, which I'm the one to begin with. Um, and you can join what's called the ADLC Green Team. And it's just a spot for you to be able to choose these actions. They're either daily actions, like I mentioned with the meditations, or the specific actions. So we'll play some of those. Like for me, it was deciding where you could um, dispose of medications um, properly. And, and they have a link to show you places right near you that, that take medications that are there and you're not using them or expired um, to safely uh, dispose of them. 
So that's another option of something you can choose. And uh, they make it kind of fun and kind of a game uh, by accumulating points as well. So it kind of keeps you engaged through the month. Uh, but there are different, lots of different activities. So I'm going to start with uh, uh, their echochallenge.org is how you get get into it. There's lots of echo challenges, some of them are physical <laughs> challenges, so we've got to make sure you get to the right spot. Uh, EchoChallenge.org is where we're, where we're going to. Because they've had, uh, they, they've had a little bit of a uh, computer glitch, I'll uh, explain that because we've been trying to get some people into it. It's, it's typically done best from uh, your uh, a laptop or a desktop or something. Apparently it's more difficult with the phone to get started. And, and the reason for that is, so for instance, um, you would come into this and you have to, to sign in first. So you create, you create an account. So you go to echochallenge.org and you create this account. And over here you can see team members that we have. I can't looking at it. So it lists each of the people who are participating, and you can actually share posts and talk about things that you're you're doing or looking at as well. So share, so it's kind of incorporating everybody together to be able to to learn together and to suggest what. Yeah. So when we log on, we're supposed to figure out how to get to the A ELC team. And that's what I'm going to go to. Okay. Um, you, when you log on and create yourself, you have to join a team. And, and that's to, to have you show up even on their system. And there's been a little bit of a problem, and, and we did, I don't think they've completely got it ironed out, that if you go to try to select the ADLC green team, um, it um, doesn't let you join. So you have to, what you have to do first, and apparently that's for, for all of them, what you'll do first is um, go to the teams. So the selection that you might have to make is the community team. So you go into a community team. It's a general one for all of Echo Challenge. All right. So you'd select that. So here's this community team there um, that you can select. So you'd select that community team. And that at least gets you started, gets you on to their uh, to their website, um, into the program. Actually, I better go back one step because it doesn't do it since I'm already logged on. They have different things going on, so you want to make sure you're selecting the Earth Month uh, program. And it's right now; it's the first one that shows up on the screen. And uh, they have several, and they have because they have things going on all year. So you want to select the Earth Month challenge to begin with, and that takes you into what we're looking at now, where the teams are. Um, I'm sorry. Slower. You have to type in the word community team to get that shot. I think uh, now because I haven't gone back again. I've been working with a few people getting in. I think it's initially going to ask you to select a team, and so when it says choose your team, select community team. Are you thinking Yes, it should because it, it, it wants you to be on a team to start with. So it's going to say. Um, Choose your team, join a team is what I'm the forgetting. Yeah. Any chance you could write this step by step and give it to Cindy so she could? Cindy's taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm just thinking. So we can do that. And actually, if anybody wants to, after we're done here, I'll get you stuff signed up and yeah, right, right here, we can do it um, as well. That might make it easier because I have been back and forth with some people on the moment emails and stuff and but it is and even I had to kind of figure this work around because I was emailing them as well and they said sorry things aren't working like that if you wanted to um because they have over seven thousand people signed up already in this program so they got they got hit with a lot it's actually uh, 43 countries um 54 states and territories so this is spread out from a, a big area and I think it was probably more of an overload they expected to coordinate the, to the, the getting into it and so I can help people right afterwards kind of just talking through it a little bit here to give you an idea and showing you some of it um theoretically when you first join on but some people have already joined but they didn't get onto a team 
So if you'd already joined, and you want to get into the team, you would have to type in community team to be able to, to access that, okay, to get into it. And once you've selected that and joined that community team, then you can go into, then you have to search out the ADLC green team. And you would click on the ADL State Green Team and it'll say, hey, do you want to join this team? And you say, yes, I want to join. Ooh, boop, there we are. You're in with, uh, in with everybody else. Now, how it comes up, there's a, a place for your, for your action categories. And they've taken those 17 SDGs and created five categories of activities. So for instance, one is basic needs and security. So we'll select basic needs and security and things that they have. You can calculate your water footprint is something you can do in that, or it's asking you to do that. And there's all these learning dialogues underneath it. So once you've selected something, you can learn more about that. If you want to know, and they give you, that's how I found out about the medicines. One of those learning ones was, uh, it took you to a site, uh, a government site, that lists all the places where you can dispose of medications. So other things, make zero waste meals. So they talk you through how that could happen and they'll learn more. Uh, know your produce, where's it coming from? I know there's a, a list of certain ones that are more likely to have uh, be treated uh, with pesticides and the like. So they're trying to educate you on you know, which ones are more likely best for you to get organic because they're more susceptible to um, pesticides or more heavily used with pesticides. Um, get involved in water justice movement. And, and sometimes they just, they'll just list like minutes. And they'll, you just select, say, okay, I wanna spend 30 minutes, just, you know, a little bit of time just looking at this area. So water justice uh, or water sanitation and learn more about it. So again, there's some things here um, or that could jog you into looking Google or something, uh, something related to that or something local. Um, we happened to have gone to a salmon extinction event last Saturday, which was put on by 350 Tacoma, the Sierra Tacoma, uh, and a few other organizations. So you find some of those things and become involved in finding out more about them. So there, there are lots of ways. These give you a bunch of opportunities, but hopefully there can be others as well. So practice a shared economy, take showers that are shorter, um, reduce animal product consumption, need to know your watershed, support renters' bill of rights, volunteer <coughs> in the community. So you know, a lot of people are already doing that here. And if you feel like, hey, I've already did this, you can select that as, as your option too. You get a little credit for that for saying, I, I do this, you don't have to select it. Um, or learn about basic needs. And you can customize, you can create your own if you wanted to, too. So, hey, now this is where I'd really like to spend some time. So, Lonnie might spend some more time on local uh, salmon populations at the land development group here in Big Harbor, and that might be hers. And she's already done that, but she's like, that I did it. Um, but uh, those are some of the things you could do if you wanted to create something additional for you to spend time. Something just struck you as man, this seems like it's it's important in, in the care of Mother Earth. This is what I want to what I want to work on. Um, so those are the categories for that particular one, and each one of them um, has uh, these categories, and you select. And to, to be honest, I think the best way is just to select a couple. We can start with just say, you know, because time isn't an issue to begin with. You know, some of these can't, some of them are daily. Um, and it may sometimes that felt like for us, it was one of them was spend more time outside. So you select that and say, okay, I want to spend this much time outside um, on a daily basis. Um, and so Sharon and I went out for five and a quarter hours yesterday walking at 360 Park. Um, so I went to put in our time and said, sorry, it's got to be 180 minutes or less. So there are some limitations <laughs> to, to the software. 
uh, but you guys are super achievers. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and they do. They congratulate you. That's <laughs> what I say. You did it. You know? So they're they're being they're being encouraging. So within this one, there are more that you can choose. So there's lots of options, and I'd say choose a couple just to glance through all the five groupings and categories and say, okay, this, this enters me first. And once you've got a feel for that and, you, and you've done that, then you can go in and select some more, you know, when you have, when you see that you still have time um, or you see that you want to get some more points and move yourself up on the ladder. <laughs> a little challenge to that. Um, so I get this particular category. And again, they're broad. It's, it's, it's more than the, the sustainable development goals and therefore, within the encompassing of our earth, include inequalities. They include not only taking care of the earth, they include taking care of people, they include taking take care of marginalized people or learning about marginalized people. So it's it's broad, you know. So there's lots of places to, to enter it and to, to learn from it. So like here, support indigenous and first nations communities um, is one. Track your purchases communicate constructively. So sometimes it's just even, I want to take so many minutes each day to just really listen to somebody um, that's that's close to me. So it really, it, it's a concentration like, okay, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very intentful on my, my listening to people and, and uh, seeing what they're, what, they're, what they're trying to say or are saying and communicate with them. So they can be very general and uh, very uh, personal. And they can also be, um, on the other end, more social um, and uh, world types of events. So learn about gender diversity. There's that spend time outside one. So once you've selected these, and I'll go back again to the list of them. So there's these five categories, education and livelihood, economy and communities, climate and ecosystems, um, and kind of choose the ones again that, that, that interest you at first. And then you'll go to your own dashboard that's been created for you. And if you can then manage your actions. So you've, you've selected them, and once you select them, they go to your dashboard. So this has become your dashboard of things that you're looking at. Um, so, so in, for instance, I have a couple of the health and equity um, that I'm doing right now. And also then another, I think most of them are health and equity for some reason. <laughs> um, and then it gets you, sometimes if it's a daily one, you go in and say, so like today, I spent my 30 to 20 minutes um, and I would do a check-in and um, just list out that I spent reading my books and thinking about the thoughts of them. Um, and then you'd submit it and give you a little congratulations, <laughs> you did it. <laughs> And that increases your points if you're really uh, interested in that. If you're uh, the, your particular points, they you know, compare yourself with the other group in there and who's got points. I'd love to see, you know, I, I've set kind of as a starting goal of at least having 10 people, at least, that can participate in this. And, and that to me is a good beginning um, because this is, takes place every year. So, you know, as we get more mobilized in this, maybe others would. Find, uh, especially since it, along the way of we're learning about things that are related to care for for the earth, um, we'd be more likely to be interested in, in doing and joining something like this um, later on. Um, so, dashboard again. So every day, then you have daily actions up there or one-time actions. So uh, one of the, again, when I talk about just spending time. Um, so support indigenous First Nation communities. And so what I've decided, I just heard the other day, um, the end of the line um, is a documentary on the women of Standing Rock. Um, I happened to listen to a, a talk by a woman who was part of that, the editorial group in creating this, and they have an hour and a half documentary. Um, so I'm gonna start there watch that documentary and learn from that uh, on what took place. Apparently it's uh, pretty intense uh, filming because it's showing uh, the women of Standing Rock being abused as well um, through their desire to care for water. That's their, their focus. Water is vital and when we think about our own bodies 
and the moisture in the world, um, that, that they are caretakers of water. And they were standing up for uh, water and they took a lot of punishment. I've read other things as to a lot of how that was hidden um, so that that wasn't expressed. But this editorial, this documentary was specifically created by um, indigenous people um, that they came in with the cameras and the like and created this documentary. So you get to that point though, you should learn more. So yeah, I'm gonna spend that time to learn that. And then once I've done that, I can check in, I click check in and say, okay, I've, I've, I've done that. Um, and I think what you'll find is when you're doing these kind of things, it will lead you to, to other, other uh, things to, to look at. For instance, I'm fascinated with trees. I love trees. Um, so a lot of you probably heard of um, uh, Peter Wohl a little bit, um, a German man who basically is a tree caretaker. And he wrote the book, The Hidden Life of Trees. Um, and we just watched um, a documentary with me and another one still going into, into those trees and the communication that takes on the ground, underneath the ground. It's always being active, how they communicate to other trees, how he was shown again, because I originally heard there's a 600 year old stub that still has some life to it. It can't grow um, because it doesn't have the seed production to be able to, to grow a tree, but it's still the Cambrian and stuff is still being supported by the energy and the nutrients of the other trees. And he's, and he's spent his time trying to figure out, well, why is that? What, what, what good is that? Well, you know, it's just like we look towards elders to communicate the things that are necessary for us to know. You know, we just started to scratch out our own experience. We're probably not going to advance too far as compared to anybody else. The trees do the same. So this ancient tree likely experienced a lot through its lifetime and how it addressed things during its lifetime. And those trees somehow can continue to communicate that through rhizomes and, and fungi uh, under the ground to share that knowledge with other trees. So just a fascinating book. It makes you look at trees in just a, a totally different light. Um, and then uh, Orion Magazine created a book, The Old Growth, forwarded by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And that is just individual stories about trees. Um, and of both old growth and, and newer growth. So just some real fascinating things. And again, that comes from you, you find something somewhere, like what this program could do is get you, get you intrigued at something and, and moves you on. And you can, you know, if you just wanted to spend your time doing that, that's good too. Because every little bit, and that's what they're explaining to us, every little bit helps. Just any little thing that you can do to be, to, to put your attention, your intention, your action, on Mother Earth will improve the situation for Mother Earth. So any questions in particular about this? Again, afterwards, I'd be happy to get people signed in. Uh, uh, like I and then you can even put a, a little photograph. So put up one when we were up on Mount Townsend in the snow, because uh, it was kind of fitting for a, a nature uh, picture with uh, winds blowing and you're up there. Um, and again, it'll go on through the month. Got all these challenges, daily challenges uh, to keep you intrigued and interested. I know that our friend Sharon the Cross, the one that originally told us about it, she's into mending things. She's always been that way. So she had more creative patches on the clothes for um, for forever. So she's in, in her, if you look through the um, the, the chats of things going on. She talks about all these different books for clothing mending, for finding different ways to find clothing. Um, you know, she just got a lot of resources, and that's what they're saying as well. And she find a resource. Uh, why don't you share that? For instance, she'd also said, "Well, I'm looking to find some kind of a uh, a different shampoo." You know, maybe a bar soap or something like that. What just happens? A friend of ours has a business in the Burley area called Burley Bubbles, and she makes natural soaps and shampoos. I believe Sharon's actually helped her um, make some of those and help her sell at craft fairs and the like. Um, so make that connection, and somebody else gets to, to learn from that. We're going to take her some so she can some try it as well. Um, just different ways to cut back on um, 
chemicals in that case, or even the, the, all the individual wrappings of stuff that are uh, encompassing these products. Um, for instance, we uh, and, and companies are looking at this better. And I think then you start to encourage companies to rethink things. We get these tubs of a, a protein drink um, from a company called Vega. So this year they came out with their own sustainable goals. And one of them is to not have to be using plastic tubs anymore. So they're looking at creative ways. And I'm sure that happens because people like us say, yeah, what, what other options do we have? Uh, for instance, uh, we've we've been purchasing recently compostable bag, babies, little babies um, that we'll use more hiking and stuff. So I use them and they're actually more durable than a standard plastic one. Um, and they're cleanable, so you can clean them out, not too bad. And then afterwards, we throw them on our compost bin and because they're uh, organic matter and they'll, they'll break down. So you know, those kind of things we learned from the companies learn from us asking them. So one of the ones in here, I haven't selected it yet, is to research the product that you buy. So it's okay, look at all the purchases that you've made during the week. And then now go back and look at what companies produce them, how, how they operate, where, where they find their product, um, how they produce it. So, and then we become consumers that are educated to be able to, to communicate with those companies um, whether, yay, you're doing a good job, that's great, or maybe oh, could you do this a little bit more, what could, what could be done differently? So to create and inspire um, a different way of looking at things. So that is um, that eco challenge. Um, again, I think it's a, it's a good program to, to learn a little bit, again, have some fun with. Um, so go ahead and have some fun with it um, if you'd like. I don't know how many of you know or are familiar with the uh, Christian climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe. Um, I had I'd heard about her um, a few months ago, and then uh, I sit in with her ministry's community connections um, once a month at a meeting, and they were really um, they suggested she has a, a group of nine videos that this uh, company called Tier Fund, this organization, has put together to talk about climate from a Christian con uh, context. I'm going to play a couple of those videos so we can uh, converse about them a little bit if we'd like as well. So she's actually out of Texas. Basically, people ask her questions. Um, and I'm going to play the first one. Uh, what we can do as a church. And the question was asked, because they kind of, uh, is what advice would you give churches that want to do something together to combat the effects of climate change. So again, these are short four to six minute ones. What advice would you give churches that want to do something together to combat the effects of climate change? So the first piece of advice I would give to any community, any organization, any church that wanted to address climate change is, and you won't be surprised when you hear me say this now, talk about it, bond, connect, and inspire. Why is talking so important? Because surveys show that while the majority of us accept the fact that climate is changing, and we agree that it will affect future generations of plants and animals and people in developing countries, none of us think it will affect us and we don't talk about it. And if we don't talk about it, why would we care? And if we don't care, why would we act? People often say, well, talking about it, it just it seems kind of almost like a cop-out. It's such a low-key response to such a large global challenge. But here's the thing. Talking about it can be the first domino in a good way this time, not a bad way. This study was released just this past year, and it found that talking about it, the simple act of having a conversation, initiates a true positive feedback effect. How? Well, first of all, the more we talk about it, the more we know. The more we know, the more concerned we are. The more concerned we are, the more we talk about it. And so, as they say, these findings suggest that climate conversations with friends and family enter into a pro-climate social feedback loop. What do 
we talk about. We don't talk about science or how bad it is. We talk about why it matters to us and what we can do to fix it. And then there's another study that also came out this past year that I thought was so encouraging. It talked about how children can make a difference. They looked at children in North Carolina, which is a conservative state in the United States, and they looked at having those children, middle school children, receive education on climate change, but they didn't track the children's opinions, they tracked the parents' opinions. And what they found is that there was a significant difference in the parents' opinions after the children learned about the issue. That's pretty encouraging. So first is talk about it, and then second is act in community. And the good thing is this will give you even more to talk about, because again, talking about it is so important, and we can talk about what we are doing, what we've done personally, what our church is doing, what other churches have done, what other organizations have done. Acting is important, but talking about how we're acting is also important. So how can we act in community? Well, here's just a couple of examples. So first of all, you can model good stewardship. Do an energy audit of your building. Figure out how to reduce your carbon footprint and your energy bills. Create a green team of like-minded people to explore ways to uh, reduce your carbon footprint. Make your potlucks and coffee hours zero waste. Look at plant-based foods. And that leads to number three, share resources. Often people aren't quite sure which light bulbs are most efficient. What type of travel is best? Do you have a solar panel installer you'd recommend? Encourage action, provide resources for people that they can use, facilitate information, facilitate access to resources, and facilitate access to change. And then step number four, support organizations that care about climate change and reflect our values. Tier Fund is obviously one of those. Arasha is another one, Climate Stewards, Plan with Purpose, Operation NOAA. All of these are organizations that embody Christian values, that embody the concepts of stewardship, of caring for the poorest and most vulnerable on this planet, and also preparing for the impacts of changing climate and reducing our own contribution to the problem. I'm kind of starting to do that right now, even here, talking about it. Um, and uh, one element of this that I really like is to share the things that matter to you. Start with that from a conversation point. If we looked at, we love the beauty of the area that we live in, um, and and how what, what would be the effect if that was affected by climate change in a way that the beauty is no longer here? So talk about those things. What what, what matters to you about what's around you, um, and and how would you feel if if that were uh, eliminated? Um, and in that conversation, then we can start looking at okay. Would we not want others to have that same experience? Fresh air, clean, clean skies, clean water. Um, would we want others to, to, to have that as well? So, and or even we have the, the Mason bees that are out there now, and looking at the newsletter, I like sharing that information, you know, how we as a, as a church are um, helping the pollinating process of our area right now through those Mason bees. And, and again, the organization rent Mason bees, that, that's their primary goal is to just get people aware of, educated in um, what's, uh, what pollinators do uh, to, to keep us alive. Which I read the other day, 80% of our foods are pollinated in some way. And so, you know, we really do lose our pollinators who contribute a majority of that. You know, we're, we're in a world of hurt. We're not eating. Does food matter to us? Does good, healthy food matter to us? Um, so, those kind of conversations, what, what matters to us? Do you have any advice on how we have fellow Christians understand the importance of working to end climate change? I'm often asked, how do we make people care about climate change? And we often proceed that with the assumption that people don't have the right values they need. And some 
how we have to figure out how to instill new values into people well past the age when that's even really possible. If you have children, if you've been around children, you know that at an early age it is possible to instill values. And we know that as an adult, sometimes our values can very slowly and somewhat reluctantly change. But overall, trying to change large numbers of people's values in order to care about an issue is not going to work. But here's the good news. The good news is that I'm convinced that 99% of us, perhaps even more, not 100%, but almost, 99% of us already have the values we need to care about climate change. We just haven't connected the dots. In other words, there are already things that we value, things that we hold dear, things that we love, things that we're concerned about, and these things are being affected by the impacts of a changing climate and or would benefit from solutions to a changing climate, but we just don't realize it. And here's the beauty of it. When we approach people from a perspective of you already care, let me help you connect the dots. First of all, we're not approaching them from a judgmental perspective. Because if you approach somebody with the underlying assumption that you don't care about the right things, you don't have the right values, that perspective can leak through subconsciously. And we are very good as humans at picking that up, at picking up that judgment and that condemnation, that self-righteousness, that holier-than-thou attitude. So rather than approaching people with, I need to fix you, or you need to fix yourself, if we approach people with, I'm sure you do care, but you just haven't connected the dots yet. Let me help you connect the dots. And this is really important to show that not only are you already the perfect person to care, in fact, you do care, you just haven't realized it, but, and this is very key, by acting on this issue, we are an even more genuine expression of who we are. So it isn't that caring about climate change isn't inconsistent with who we are. It's that caring about it and acting on it is a genuine and authentic expression of who we are. And it enables us to express who we are more fully. And that's what we all really want to do. We want to be who we are. So when it comes to understanding the barriers that we've put up, it's really important, I think, to recognize also that the barriers are not just lack of understanding. People say, well, people don't know enough information, so we just need to hit them upside the head with more information. Well, the real problem, though, unfortunately, is this, and social science over the last 10 years has shown this very clearly. First of all, we haven't connected the dots between what we care about and how that's being affected by climate change. So we tend to think, well, I'm not the right person to care. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not a tree hugger. I don't vote for the right political party. That's just not who I am. Then the second problem we have is one called psychological distance. We humans are very bad at recognizing the risk or the threat posed by issues that we believe are far off in space or in time. In other words, if we think they'll affect us in the future, but not now, or if we think they affect people far away, but not here, we are really good at pushing those to the side. And then the third problem is solution aversion. Many of us believe the only solutions are unpleasant solutions, unpalatable solutions, solutions that will make our lives worse rather than better, solutions that, frankly, I'd rather have the impacts rather than the solutions to. So how do we address these real problems? We address them through exactly what we we're talking about, through talking about climate change, through connecting the dots between what we already care about, why it matters, and what we can do to fix it. So the same steps that we just saw as the problems can be turned into solutions. So she has a number of that you could look up under this tierfund.org if you're interested. She's talking about even uh, scriptural basis for care of climate change. Uh, it's kind of one of the first ones that the Bible say about the natural world um, on through. So uh, there are some other resources. I don't know if you friend actually sent me this book called Nature's Best Hope. And it's about turning your own yard into uh, 
natural forest, a national forest, in other words. And I just watched a, a video from him as well the other day talking about he actually took a 10 acre area, he says, which is bigger than most of you are going to have, a uh, 10 acre area and converted to natural species of plants. And he's got like 800 and some different caterpillars that he's documented now, um, butterflies of an immense number. And he takes even smaller, he's even done this with people in an urban environment and said, okay, make this change and put this natural. Like we were walking into Coleman the other day and there, there's some houses that really convert their, their yards into a very natural, natural area. And you can just see it's probably teeming with life. But she even just showed the number of species that are encouraged to be there um, and just by changing some of the plants that are, that are in your own yard. And another aspect of that is that even it's likely with climate change, trees that are, trees need to be an environment that can survive and, and they're going to have to move. But we haven't given them corridors to move because they will, you know, birds will take seeds and plant them in a different area. Um, winds will, will move things. So eventually, you know, if necessary, they're going to move, but we've cut them off with highways, we've cut them off with uh, major cities. So we're even talking about what areas that uh, both animals or plants could move, could move through. And know have swim, we have a friend that lives at a place and they've created a whole section They've left it that surrounds a creek as well. And sure enough, the wildlife walks through that 20 foot area and they have it for an expanse of area. So, an opportunity for them to, to move. So, another good book if you want to look at your own yard um, and how you can use that to create um, a more alive, a more diverse, because Basically, that's what it boils down to. Uh, we need to have diverse in terms of species that are there um, and um, plants and animals um, combined to, to make the, it habitable. God has done wonders to create a variety um, in our world, and it takes that variety really to, to sustain it and to give it what we have. Um, yes. Of nature's best hope. If you're interested too, you can always just ask me things to email me. Uh, UCC had him uh, over and talked two weeks ago. And so I have uh, there the YouTube of him talking and describing what's done and how, how they've worked on it, both on his own uh, farm and, and people in suburban, suburban areas and rural areas. Um, and then that kind of leads you on to looking at, okay, like the Pacific Northwest, what are the native plants of the Pacific Northwest that you could put? And so he's talking, you want to do this, and he says, most people bring in this and this, and they, we got those in our yard. <laughs> and they're not really, it's not supporting enough life, basically. They're not the right uh, for our area to, to support the, the life that we need to keep things healthy. So again, if anybody wants to join up today, and I can walk you through it here afterwards, make it easier, or you can just try it at home too. And if you have, have questions, you can, you can contact me, I can help. Questions or comments at that point, at this point? Thanks for joining. Appreciate you, share, appreciate you sharing so many resources and I know that you've done all this work and read all these books. So you really are a resource for us. for resources, you know, how can we kind of combine resources or asking different people? And I think, you know, even though I have read a lot, I feel like I don't know any 
anything. <laughs> but but we can all share together and learn from each other. So I know Ronnie's always getting me on to looking at something and learning from something. Other people contact me and say, oh, have you ever heard about this? You know, I have a question. I go and dig into that. It's just a way of expanding our knowledge by talking to each other and sharing those things but that would be great we're going to try again and i think this month for the green team was uh, displaying the, the mason bees but every month having something in the newsletter that talks about something um, from the, the natural setting so we can start doing that and again there's other um sort of an organization we're trying to work with on recycling they recycle little bits of fabric um, the tabs on bread tabs that they use um, in, uh, in other areas. Glass. Glass, yeah, more more readily. Um, actually, our friend over at Chelan County, they have a, an organization that bought this piece of equipment that crushes the glass and they actually put it back into the sand form. Um, after they crushed it, they heat it up enough for it to go back to sand and they incorporate that into production products. Um, I think, wow, that would be cool to have around here because I know a lot of places you're going to stop taking glass. Yeah. And yet, when you think about it, Robin Wall Kimmer was talking about the other day about what's, what's natural. You know, well, glass is sand, yeah. <laughs> basically, mixed with something else to either come up with color uh, or consistency. Uh, but that's what it is. It's a natural. So you got to get it back to that, to that form. Whereas, you're not going to convert plastic back to the oil to be used in any kind of sustainable way. Um, we've talked, you and I have talked, talked about this before. Uh, one of the goals of this one organization uh, is spending time outside. Um, I'm, I'm suggesting that we have a walking group, uh, 360 trail park, you know, that I will as well. Then a group of us walk, we can do the easy trails, and we don't have to take these very hilly side trails. So, yeah. And there used to be a real walking group here, too. Yeah, I mean, there's one of them. That was actually more hiking. That would uh, be great, too. <laughs> right. Or even, you know, I, I walk Christian Trail every day every day at lunchtime. And there's certain areas where the birds are just <laughs> incredible, partly somebody's feeding them. So I'm always, always looking for the little hummingbird hanging up on the tree, sitting there on a branch. We, learn, we watched a documentary, if you want to, on, I think it was Prime, on hummingbirds with uh, um, Attenborough leading it. Oh, hummingbirds are incredible. Um, and and uh, the varieties throughout the world. Um, but so there's certain areas, even on the Christian tree, you have to go very far. And you can get to just, Birds all over the place flying around you. And you know, have, all, have the hawks or the eagles up above as you're heading out towards some of the newer sections of the Christian Trail. Um, and at different times of the year, you come at certain times of the day, the rabbits are just everywhere. <laughs> so, right That's now, right. The, the 360 Trail Park in the lower areas, trilliums everywhere. Oh, me. Yes, it's trilliums and 360. A lot of mushrooms. We saw mushrooms yesterday that were. Uh, to learn there's like 22,000 mushrooms or something or, you know I guess maybe that's mosses um Robin Wall Kimmer has a book on mosses as well um, so there's just so much we can learn just by taking a walk so it's a good idea just FYI you can take your 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 drugs to the Dick Harbor City Hall anytime City Hall is open and to the right where the police department is and there's a thing that looks like a mailbox you just put them right in there Good suggestion. So in, in Gig Harbor itself, the city hall, they'll take medications. Um, they have a container there to be able to put them into. That's often the case that uh, different police departments, I know like the Puyallup Police Department used to do that, was on certain days, it wasn't every day. But even if you're out on the peninsula, the pretty costless uh, center is one of those places listed that you can take your medications to too. So there are lots of, I was surprised, there are probably 30 places I just put in our area code of 9329. There are about 30 places within five miles that in some fashion would take or are accepted to, to take those products. So lots of things we can learn and just share with each other. As Ronnie just reminded me, uh, I unfortunately can't join because of the first Saturday month breakfast that I usually go to. 
but an actualist on the Key Peninsula uh, organizes a walk every first Saturday of the month, right at nine o'clock. Eight thirty. Eight thirty at the Gateway, and he, uh, he also publishes uh, columns. You probably know that mm -hmm. in the KP News. Chris Lurick, very his columns are very very interesting. So it's another possibility for. And there are those things around uh, to be able to do. So yeah, we were by we came a little later yesterday. Three sixty park went over by the the uh, Beaver Pond area and the like as well. Sharon and tons of hummingbirds throughout the walk with their, their distinctive buzz as you go around. Up and deer. I've seen. I've run up there in the winter time when there's a little. The snow and you've seen the coyote tracks all over the place. We've seen the coyotes heading up the, the, the trail, the, the power line trail. Uh, seeing the coyotes just off. off Lots of rabbits, and especially yeah. this time of the year. <laughs> Go at dusk to the cave, to the gateway park. You might see the beavers come out of their lodge. Mm -hmm. Tony says you might see the beavers come out of the lodge there at the gateway park. Where the, the beaver pond is. They're very, very creative. Very different. Thank you, everybody.